All right, uh, antitrust policy notice, just reminding everyone uh, weekly on that. And for the agenda, uh, a couple things today. So first and foremost, um, just want to let everyone know Dan Middleton has been elected as the TSU chair for the 2018-2019 cycle. Uh, so congrats to Dan and also a huge thank you to Chris Ferris for uh, his leadership, all the hard work, um, just bringing the project from inception uh, up to this point and seeing the umbrella grow from um, no projects up to 10 projects. So that's been really exciting. Uh, but with that, uh, Dan, um, if you wanted to say, you know, a couple quick welcome words and then we can move into the agenda from there. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, I guess in addition to the the uh, the notice that we normally kick off with, I uh, also just wanted to kick off these meetings by pointing out that all are welcome here. We're interested in the, having the most en enthusiastic and, and constructive participants who are interested in advancing blockchain. So. That is the main criteria for joining us here in this meeting and in others. Uh, and then uh, also wanted to give a, a special thanks to Chris. Uh, unfortunately, he's not on to hear this, but uh, I think in, in my experiences as an engineer and in other places in life, if you've got a, a well-defined problem, uh, usually the, the solution to that's a little bit easier than being able to define the problem in the first place. And that's certainly the, the case for having launched such a large organization as Hyperledger, where we had uh, essentially no definition at the outset. And as, as Todd just mentioned, that we're, we're up to uh, 10 projects at this point and a number of labs and working groups. So uh, I think that's uh, quite an accomplishment. And I know it was an extra burden for, for Chris to have handled along with his other roles that he contributes here. Um, and then uh, my last thought along those lines is now that we do have uh, enough structure that we do start to have what look like, uh, if not well-defined problems, problems that we can hopefully get some addition, additional definition around, uh, it would be good to start addressing those. Uh, we've got a rather full agenda today, but I'd like to send out a note probably right after uh, this call with some thoughts on what some of those areas would be. And I would like to get uh, everybody's robust discussion going in the direction of uh, whether those priorities uh, are the most important ones, if there's other ones that, that we need to be considering, and some ways that we'd go about addressing those. And I think uh, without further, further comments along that lines then, I'll, I'll hand this back over to Todd to, to drive through the rest of this rather full agenda for today. Sounds good, Dan. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all that. Um, looking forward to working with you. Likewise. All right. Um, so moving into the agenda, um, kind of standard set of stuff. Uh, the first thing, the next Hackfest is just over a month out. We have around 90 registered for that already. So that's uh, fantastic numbers from my view. Uh, I suspect that'll continue to grow from there. Uh, I know Tracy and Rye have been socializing a draft agenda for that and calling for any potential topics so we can get this laid out in advance that seemed to work well in Amsterdam when we had a more structured agenda as folks walked in and we could hit the ground running. Um, so please look for that in the agenda or the minutes that go out and start putting your thoughts in there and we'll work with everyone to get that shaped up. Uh, the next section, thank you everyone that indicated interest in the doodle poll for Q1 of next year for APAC Hackfest. Um, Based on that, what it looked like was March 4th was the best option for everyone uh, that week. Um, so just wanted to do a quick call for any objections for us to hone in on a specific location and specific date pattern within the week of March 4th. Are there any concerns with that? So I indicated I could not attend and I probably won't be able to, but that's not an objection, obviously, because I don't feel like, you know, the train should stop just because of me. But I have to say, I was looking at the doodle poll and it seems like a lot of people have not responded, especially the TSC members. Yeah, so we've sent this out multiple reminders. Oh, sent it no, out. it's not yeah, your so. fault. <laughs> No, no, no. So I'm looking at wanna... Dan, Meek, and other people like this who seem to have skipped answering. So I don't know what it means. So uh, it, what it means from my perspective is I, I don't really have plans set that far out. So it's, 
somewhat unclear to me whether I would be able to attend. So I don't want to necessarily commit that, yeah, that date's good for me. And at the same time, I, I, I wouldn't object to any of those dates. I, I'm in the same boat um, that, you know, it's quite far out and, and you know, I can't make the season on whether it's January or, or any month. So um, instead of having my vote on one month or the other, that screw the others, I accept any vote that people come up with. All right, then, then that means you can proceed, Todd. I don't care. Well, it, it might be good in, in future polls to have a uh, um, undecided or something so that we can indicate that we've, you know, seen it because I'm sort of in the same boat. I don't know that I can get funding to travel um, that far out, especially that far away. And that's the same situation that I'm in. Okay. Um, we can wait on this a little bit if that's helpful for people. Um, one of the things we've been trying to do is you know, from the direction of the TSC was do more advanced notice than we had been doing because the short amount was not sufficient. So it looks like we're still working for the sweet spot in terms of that. Um, I, I think that's actually fine to get the data out early and then that helps fix uh, an otherwise moving variable in everybody's calendars. And, and at this point, what we're really trying to do is just make sure that we're not um, conflicting with some major conference or something that we're gonna lose a bunch of people at, right? I mean, if we're doing it this yep. far out. Yep. So. Okay. Uh, that all sounds good then. Uh, and then the last event reminder was just around Hyperledger Global Forum. Again, flagship event. It's the first year we're doing this event for the entire ecosystem. So technical community members, um, users, um, the, the full scope of that. So really excited to see everyone in Switzerland, December 12th to 15th. And the agenda was announced for that uh, a couple weeks ago. So please check that out and get registered there. Yeah, on and, that point, Todd, I just yes. want to pass the, you know, the, there's a bug in the agenda. The, the agenda for Friday and Saturday is a copy. So I doubt it's exactly the same. Uh, great question. I, I had the same question myself. Uh, and so that is by design. The reason for that, uh, I think that's the, um, the workshops. And so at each hour, there's, I think, three, four or five uh, parallel workshops. And the idea of having it replicated both days is so that someone is able to go through oh. multiple workshops because they can't select all five, I see. four or five at each hour. Um, so it does sound like we need some sort of notice in there because that's not yeah. the first question I've I've received. It's very confusing, but okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll have them update some verbiage in there. Uh, I suspect we'll get that question again. Um, cool. Any other event questions before we move on to project updates? All right, then uh, handing it over to the cello team. Oh, very well. I'm happy to be here to um, share the current state of the Chero project. Uh, firstly, I must say the state of the Chero is uh, is good. The community the community focus on the zero point nine point zero releasing. Since this release will contain new features, uh, so people are very active in the rocket check recently. They go there and. They go there to give feedback and report back. And the most urgent issue is the 0 0.9.0 release on this weekend. In the past uh, several months, we focused on developing the Kubernetes agent. With this feature, Chero user can easily add a Kubernetes class to Chero's resource pool and deploy fabric class on it. All this uh, operation could be manipulated through the uh, through a Fender UI. Meanwhile, our contributor also work on uh, supporting the Fabric 1.2 and refactoring the user dashboard. The user dashboard can allow user to easily deploy and invoke chain code to the Fabric cluster hosted by the channel. And um, so basically, there are there are two dashboards in general. One is for the manager to maintain the fabric cast and 
through um, through the user dashboard, the normal user could could apply Fabric class and deploy or invoke Django to the to 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 the Fabric class. Um, we also have an internal sheet program. The intern is responsible to integrate the Fabric CA into the Fabric class. The purpose are replacing the Cobra Gen by a hybrid Fabric CA client and server to generate all the crypto material and enable users to explain their Fabric network flexibly. So in the current state, the main work of the Kubernetes, Kubernetes agent Kubernetes agent and the user dashboard are finished. Uh, but the Fabric CA need more time to investigate. The, the 0 0.9.0 release will contain uh, four agents. There are Docker, Kubernetes, Redfear, and Ansible. However, the only Docker and Kubernetes agent could be operated through the manager dashboard but we will support the, the others in the future. So any question here? There we go on. So in the past quarter, we add the, we, we add the, a new maintainer and, and now the maintainer of the channel are come to four. There are about half on the Oracle. Haitao and Mi Tong from the IBM and Mi Rook, Rook uh, from the Renware. The maintainer also possibly uh, attempt the makeup to improve the influence of the channel among the hybrid community. So the current plans of the channel is the, the most the most important is ensuring the release of 0.9.0. And we are planning to support the other hybrid platforms like Bro and Indy. Also, we will introduce the hand chart tools into the channel project to use the, the to, to take the advantage of the, the take the advantage and the flexibility of the cool. Uh, Hamchat and Kubernetes community. And at last but not least, uh, we got the uh, we we got four, forty five patch sex review and merge, and five new co contributor get involved in this project since June. So that's the that's the current day of the channel project. Do you have any question about the Chero project? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't see any significant issues listed, but I, I just wanted to give you another chance to talk about anything that that are challenges, maybe not from within the, the internal operation of your project, but things that that maybe the the TSC should be aware of. He, sorry, could you say again? I'm not hear you really clearly. Yeah, let me try again. Um, I'm just wondering if if there's any issues that you would like to highlight that you feel that the TSC can assist with. Can six with? Can help you with. Can help me with. Yeah. Uh, Uh, look, the the question is actually uh, whether the project uh, needs some help from the TSC side, um, maybe like uh, help promote uh, the Cello project or uh, improve the collaboration with other projects, I think. Okay, so yeah, actually we are developing the Kubernetes agent, which is a really complex and um, only few uh, contributors uh, get involved in this new feature so maybe we need more 
more power or resource to to improve the the to improve this uh, new feature because uh, I think Kubernetes is a, is a very important platform uh, in the current uh, how in the current uh, environment. So so. So this is the main, main, main. Okay, thanks. So you're looking for maybe some uh, helping recruit people with Kubernetes skills to go um, yes. make contributions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, great. And then I'm I'm curious uh, for your geographic diversity of maintainers and contributors are uh are most contributors in asia time zones or are things uh predominantly in in us or, or european time zones in asia time zone, we got three maintainers in asia and ba basically in beijing time zone and one maintainer Litong in the us time zone. okay Great, and then that might be different than at least some of the other projects that have uh, maybe a more uh, co a higher concentration of U.S. time zones. And I wonder if there's any challenges that you observe with uh, cross-project meetings or, or working group interactions uh, that might relate to having different time zones uh, or other communication factors due to the geographical differences? Yeah, but the communication bit are most happening in the uh, rock chat. Uh, but we get some, but we also have some um, communicate tools like WeChat. So basically, uh, uh, we, we basically don't have uh, don't have this uh, type of type type of issue to so yeah that's this this is a quite good quite question I might I'm not exactly know how well, to well uh, maybe let me add one comment the. Weekly meeting of Cello is uh, it's uh, Friday evening in uh, Beijing time, while it's uh, the morning of the U.S. side. So uh, maybe it's uh, uh, for the U.S. developers they need to uh, get up sometime earlier, like at uh, seven or or eight. So that may be a kind of challenge. Okay, thanks. Well, I think as we're starting to develop maybe another community working group, which is down lower on our agenda, if any of those communication or, or other factors occur to you, uh, it would be good to introduce those into that discussion. Yeah, okay. definitely. Thanks, Dan, for the question. I, I had a question as far as, um, since you're more or less based on Fabric, how closely do you follow the Fabric release. So Fabric just released 1.2, I believe. So when will Cello be compatible with version 1.2? Yeah, yeah, the Cello is uh, compatible with the 1.2 right now. But, but you know, Cello have uh, many agents like Docker and Kubernetes, Vistria and Hemsworth. Uh, as far as I know, the, the Docker's agent is uh, compatible with the uh, 1.2 right now, but the Kubernetes agent is only compatible with the 1.0.5. However, we have already tested Kubernetes agent uh, with the 1.1.0 uh, fabric, uh, but in the 0.9.0 uh, release of the channel, the Kubernetes agent will only support the, the 1.0.5. One, yeah. So this is the, the current, current, current the situation. Thank you. 
So what are the main uh, technical challenges around uh, bringing the Kubernetes agent up? Wow, to wow. The, point two? The, 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 the biggest challenge is it, the network price is really hard to figure out. And as far as, uh, you know, a user of the fabric can define their organization, right? They can, they can, uh, they can define their organization and demand it like uh, or, or you one point example.com. However, this domain won't work in the Kubernetes. Uh, in the, within the Kubernetes, P, the peer to discover other peer uh, have uh, many restrictions in the domain name. So we, uh, so we do. We don't want to bring this restrict to the uh, fabric user. So this is the biggest challenge we make so far. Um, we uh, so we we have some plans like introduce and ingress to resolve those demand demand. But I, I, I but we have not to. We haven't investigated too deep so far. So I have a different question that has more to do with the project life cycle status of this project. I mean, not that I, you know, want to push the project per se, but have you guys looked at what, you know, it would take? I mean, so your project is in incubation. I would expect any hyperledger project to have the ambition to eventually graduate to active status. And so I wonder if you guys have thought about it. Oh, could you please help to answer this question? Yeah, yeah that, uh, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, Arnold, uh, our plan is to release a 1.0 at the end of the year. And after that, we will try to be uh, become active. So that seems a bit backward. I mean, we, we've allowed for some project to go to 1.0 with that being an active status, but we all kind of said, well, it's not desirable and shouldn't be the norm. So I would expect you to seek graduating, graduating to active status first. Um, actually, we it's not uh, desired to um, become active uh, after 1.0 for us. Uh, we consider to be active uh, for our uh, code quality. So currently, uh, there are still several major features in plan, and uh, we uh, need more uh, um, adoption of the uh, project to fix bugs. So. But we will definitely consider your suggestion. Maybe okay. uh, tomorrow actually is our weekly meeting. I will uh, propose uh, this subject and uh, we'll discuss with other maintainers. Okay, and again, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't mean to push you especially, specifically, but I think it's a good exercise for all the projects to kind of do this kind of assessment every now and then, you know, looking at the executoria and saying, okay, where where do we stand now compared to those? Because it can, it can kind of give you some guidance as to maybe some area that need a bit more improvement that you should focus on. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Thanks a lot, Sir Desi. Thank you. I also see a comment on Rocket Chat about uh, supporting other blockchains. I, I did take a look at the the Cello proposal uh, to refresh myself on the on the intended scope, and I know that originally there there was an interest in supporting the breadth of hyperledger frameworks. Uh, I think that would be something that I would be looking for uh, in a move to uh, at least a move to a 1.0, if not a move to active status. That the the project was on track to reach the scope that it had been chartered with. Look, do you have comments? I think we that's our that's definitely the project plan to support the multiple platforms. Yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah, actually we already uh consider 
support and implement the support of uh, Explorer. And uh, we have also uh, contact with the composer team and uh, the India team. And uh, certainly uh, uh, in uh, weekly meetings, uh, several weeks before we discussed the, the harm chart support uh, with David, uh, which uh, we believe may be a more efficient way to use uh, harm chart to support like the uh, saw to the end ending. Yeah. Um, a question there, do you have any plans or strategy for reaching out to some of those communities and trying to recruit contributors? I know that if you don't have someone kind of involved in the project, it can be difficult to track changes or, or figure out how the architecture fits. Yeah, this is, <clears throat> this is Chris. I know that Google and Red Hat are both working on Helm charts, certainly for Fabric. I don't know what others they may be doing. <clears throat> but I think uh, there, you know, is, is, uh, as Nathan said, uh, we're, we're, there's definitely people out there that are doing this. And I think, you know, we need, we do need to figure out how do we get them all together and working together. Okay. Uh, we, might, we, we have uh, developed uh, developer the Hamster uh, tools to deploy the fabric clouds. Uh, but it does have some restrict. Uh, the most, uh, the most, uh, Important one is it requires a user to uh, provision an MFF server first. Um, maybe, maybe we we could um, uh, the MFF server, MFF server is basically to store the certificates of the fabric peers. So maybe we should uh, replace, uh, take out the MFF server and use the uh, Kubernetes secrets instead. So with this feature, user, the Hamchat user will 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 not be will we will not require user to prepare the MFS server. This is made this to this will make this to more flexibility. Well, well, look, I I uh, know that you have been get also getting all getting involved into the Kubernetes community. And uh, I guess it might be helpful if we can attract more developers from uh, the Kubernetes community or people with experience to help the channel project, then may be more efficient. Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let's think about it. Okay. I imagine that for several of the, the frameworks where you have people who are working on deploying those, those users end up in the community of, of that particular framework. Uh, and I wonder if there's a way that you can attract those developers or users into Cello. So you're not necessarily trying to, um, you're not going to need to rely on maintainers of, say, Burrow. But if you've got somebody who's using Burrow and deploying it, and maybe they're using Kubernetes for that, that's a user that that would be good to attract over to cello uh, and then that might help uh, grow some some development for those platforms within uh, cello yeah okay I, I think that we might be winding up discussion on this then I do want to leave enough time to reach uh, the other people who have prepared a agenda items for today is there is there anything um, additional importance that that anybody wants to discuss before we move on? No? All right. Thank you very much for preparing the the um, the update and and doing that in a timely way, and for facilitating some good discussion here. Hey Dan, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great! Finally. Um, I can fill in some of the blanks in like 30 seconds. Um, over the last month, I've been going through our community, finding all of the Helm charts and Kubernetes uh, YAML files and uh, reaching out to the authors. And I've been asking them to start going to the Cello meetings. So uh, what they were um, touching on earlier is that we've been talking about Kubernetes and Helm charts and Cello for the last month. Um, the, my proposal to the Cello team was to become the tool 
for using Helm to deploy, to at least to handle the underlying deployments of the blockchains. And then all the higher level functions of Cello um, uh, could lay on top of that. And so we wouldn't have to manage so many um, agents underneath. I, I, maybe we want to, but um, it seems to me like Kubernetes and Helm is sort of the standard that all the cloud platforms are adopting and that's the, the direction of momentum. So there is work here. If you have any more questions, email me, I'll fill you in. It's still informal right now, but we're trying to get it all organized. Thanks, Dave. All right. Uh, so for next week, uh, Hyperledger Explorer update, please. Uh, and then now, uh, next up is Architecture Workgroup. Ram, are you on? Uh, yes, I am. Good morning. Good evening, folks. Um, uh, so uh, getting started, I, is there a link that you can post? Uh, yeah, let me uh, drop that the, into uh, Rocket Chat one moment. Um, so, um, you know, overall, the uh, working group uh, is uh, is quite uh, active. We are making uh, steady progress on three work items. Uh, participation has been quite steady, about eight to 12 participants. And there's actually, given that we have uh, two tracks and three work items, there's a little bit of diversity in uh, the fact that some of, uh, we are attracting new people who are interested, for instance, specifically in the privacy and confidentiality track. Um, and so, uh, you know, we do see uh, new participants show up in the different topics of interest. Um, in terms of issues, there's no um, specific issues at this time. Uh, we definitely like the TSE support, uh, especially in getting more active participation from the, uh, from the different projects. Um, it, you know, at times, uh, you know, some of the companies and projects have, uh, you know, per, have not uh, had regular participation. Um, so uh, if we could kind of encourage that, that'll be fantastic. Um, activity in the past quarter, we've had regular meetings. Um, we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, two tracks. The regular uh, track, uh, the main track has been meeting every other Wednesday, alternating with the identity work group. And, uh, you know, on the alternate weeks, we meet on Friday, um, for the privacy and confidentiality track. Uh, besides that, um, we've had working um, you know, working sessions. Um, the last one, for instance, was a face-to-face -face meeting that uh, Oracle hosted in the Bay Area last week. Uh, thanks, Oracle, uh, Todd, for setting that up. Um, uh, and um, uh, you know, we've been making steady progress on three work items. The first one. Uh, which is uh, uh, pretty close to getting done, I believe, uh, and that's the system identities work item. Uh, we started engaging uh, the technical writer, so hopefully we are uh, at the home stretch there. Uh, the second track is the uh, privacy and confidentiality track that Mick has been uh, uh, driving, and uh, we are making good progress. Uh, you know, with the um, uh, both the model and the paper, um, so, uh, and I think we made good progress in the face-to-face -face meeting there, so uh, that's going well. And we are getting started with a track on interoperability. Um, um, Stan's been uh, taking the lead in kind of uh, putting that uh, uh, together, and uh, that's uh, still in the early stages, but I think we have a good uh, framework uh, and uh, starting progress there. Any questions on that? Um, so, uh, work product, I think uh, we, work, we are working on the system identities paper and the privacy and confidentiality paper. And uh, once uh, we make more progress uh, on the interoperability, then we'll get started on that as the next, uh, next work product. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, I think we've had uh, good diverse participation in terms of a good mix of uh, different project representation and and companies. Um, you, know, you know, it's uh, we continue to not have as much of an active participation uh, from uh, uh, Iroha as an example. So uh, you know, um, we've kind of reached out to them, but I guess they're a small group and they've been quite busy with what they've been doing. Um, 
Um, so, um, you know, whatever help we can get from the TSC to kind of encourage more broader participation would be great. Questions, comments? Thanks, Ram. I think that uh, one thing that, that I'd find interesting across the working groups is um, whether it's in these updates or maybe in separately scheduled agenda items to get uh, to get uh, a better sense of of sort of the the meaty things that are going on in in the discussions, and that could be uh, here's a here's a contentious technical topic that's being discussed, or here's a uh, an interesting finding that we didn't expect, uh, but some way to to make sure that we've got a good connection between the technical path that the work group is is finding for us and and keeping the, the TSC um, connected with that so with with that in mind is there anything that jumps out and I, I think maybe I'll uh, suggest out of the uh, the system identities paper uh, you mentioned that that's reaching uh, close to a, a mature level is there some synopsis of the findings of that paper that that you could share with us now uh, yeah, I guess I would invite all of you guys to actually let me post uh, a link to the paper. Uh, and I'd invite you guys to uh, take a look at it and provide feedback. And actually, that would be uh, a good way to kind of uh, get more folks plugged into the paper uh, itself and the work item. And, um, you know, the approach that we've taken here is to, again, stay with uh, uh, the functional requirements for, um, and just like, and this is similar to what we've done uh, for the other main functions that we've looked at, such as the consensus and smart contract and so forth, to, may, to try to attempt to stick to uh, the functional requirements for system identities. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's been the approach we've taken. Um, so if you look at the paper, it's talking about, uh, you know, what are the functional requirements for establishing the root of trust, uh, enrollment, how do you enroll system identities uh, uh, into the, um, you know, in terms of binding uh, the keys and, uh, uh, and, and the identities themselves and how we prefer to have that uh, in, uh, uh, registered in the, in the ledger itself, uh, authentication and authorization, revocation and change management, privacy, uh, and interoperability between identifiers. Um, so um, I would say um, none of this has been quite uh, controversial and there's been uh, very good consensus uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, the functional description. Um, the, what uh, the next item that we'd want to have is uh, to have the different projects actually fill out the way uh, and so this is the typical split that we've taken. Uh, we talk about uh, what in the uh, in the uh, uh, first section of the paper and how each of the uh, projects uh, are going to be implemented is going to come from each of the projects themselves. Um, so, and, and that's the section that we need to kind of complete before we kind of publish the paper. Um, so that's giving you an example of this. Uh, we should probably set up some time um, uh, to kind of go over this. The other alternate is to perhaps uh, schedule a review in one of our um, um, architecture work group meetings and invite, uh, invite the TSC members to participate. Or if it makes sense, we can actually set up a, re uh, a, a full review uh, during one of the uh, TSC meetings in the future if you think it merits the time. I'm open Thanks. to both. Yeah. I think it'd probably defer to, to you or to maybe some more discussion here to, to see what amount of time is required. But um, what do you see as the goal of this paper? Is this to reflect the current state of this part of the stack in, in Hyperledger projects, or is this to add requirements uh, that the projects may or may not be satisfying? Uh, I think it, it is... Uh... 
uh, it starts out with minimum describing the functional requirements that we all agree on um, is uh, is uh, is is already there and should be there in the roadmap of the different projects. Uh, so it's not intended just as a description of what's there in the different uh, projects, but to if uh, there is consensus that that's uh, the architectural framework that we want to create, um, we want to provide that as input to the uh, projects who are um, who who don't meet that uh, that uh, uh, functional requirement yet. That that's the direction that uh, that we are suggesting. Of course, we are not mandating that uh, they uh, do that yet, um, but you know that's the approach we're taking. Uh, is that does that answer your question? Yes. Um, In short, both. Right, right, yeah, and I think I'll probably take a little time to figure out uh, in in what way is best to use the the content that this paper will arrive at, um, and so that might be another topic for for when we discuss this uh, as a group again is. Um, your thoughts on on how this would be applied, whether it's kind of more towards the informative side for consumers outside of our communities, or whether it's more towards the uh, normative or requirement side for the projects. And I, I know you just said it's it's kind of both. Um, it's yeah, I mean, no, so so direction there. Sorry, the first two the first yeah. two papers in the series. Um, attempt to do a little bit of both, right? They were um, clearly informative, um, trying to capture sort of broad concepts and use those to actually describe the platform. So in each of those that there was sort of a, a high level description of consensus and a high level description of, of the smart contracts pieces of it. And then, and then bringing that down to the existing hyperledger platforms. And at the same time, there was also some sort of speculative or normative, um, expectations both in the language um, and in the architectural descriptions that we had for those. So I would not expect anything different from this one. Thanks. And you know, of course, the holy grail, uh, if you will, has been to kind of come up with uh, uh, a, the functional descriptions of the different functions that can be the uh, common framework that hopefully the projects are uh, working towards, right? Um, and you know, uh, as uh, as uh, any ideal holy grail kind of uh, uh, effort um, tends to be, it's more aspirational. And you know, we are not, of course, uh, so far, um, um, you know, trying to uh, enforce uh, any of that, right? It's more of here's what we think. Uh, the functional requirements should be for each of these modules, and uh, here is a, here are the information elements that uh, uh, would make sense to have uh, in the interfaces uh, if we break it out into these modules with these functions. So that's kind of the aspirational normative side, if you will. Okay, thanks. Any other thoughts, questions? All right, uh, thanks Ram. <clears throat> uh, so moving forward for the work group updates, uh, just quick reminder, next week is the identity work group update. Um, and onward from there, uh, Tracy or Rye, um, Hyperledger Community Health Work Group. I know that was teed up last week. There was some discussion there. Um, is there, updates to provide or kind of um, questions back to the TSC that resulted from there. 
so yeah, we definitely went through the, the working group charter and made some updates, uh, which we attempted to capture in the, the change log uh, based on the discussion that we had last week. Uh, really uh, rewriting the introduction to focus on how uh, we're um, changing this to, to provide extra bandwidth to projects and working groups that uh, want to work on improving participation and engagement, um, clarifying the role of metrics, that it's, it's a tool that we can use to help improve participation, but um, you know, it's, it's not the goal of this group to you know, solely produce metrics. Um, it's just one tool that we'll use uh, and that we wouldn't publish those unless the project or working group wanted to, to find, you know, have that data um, at their disposal. So, uh, and then uh, the last one was just, uh, um, you know, a question, I guess, for the, the TSC is, do we want this to, to truly be a working group or, um, you know, should this be some other sort of structure um, that maybe we don't have very well defined today um, that would basically allow us to uh, gather people together who are interested um, and to work with these different projects and working groups that express an interest. Um, but that's, that's really, I guess, up to the TSC as far as direction that we want to head um, with this particular working group charter. So <clears throat> Tracy, this is Chris. So, um, Dave posted something in the chat and I apologize I'm remote and only have my phone so I don't have access directly to the proposal itself but uh, and <clears throat> so basically his suggestion was well yeah let's you know let's develop whatever these you know metrics and so forth are but then just make that a function of what you report when you come up with your quarterly work group or whatever report mm -hmm. so that um, you know, we have some consistency in that regard <clears throat> across all the different ones. I know, I mean, I, I try to get, you know, specific actual numbers and percentages and so forth, but, you know, it'd be, it'd be useful, I think, to have, um, to have something like that as part of the, the quarter of the reporting rather than have a separate thing to come in and try and explain stuff. Because I think the, the project teams are more likely to be able to understand and make sense of the numbers that they uh, are seeing uh, and also I think having that as a function of what they're reporting makes it more likely that they'll maybe invest in trying to you know once they're measuring things then they can try and improve them. Okay. Peter Drucker. Yeah so I mean and I think that was some of what we were originally thinking but I think we got quite a lot of pushback last week and not wanting to uh, take over the, the quarterly project reports or anything like that. I mean, obviously we can do whatever it is that, that the TSC wants, right? Um, it's just a question of what, what will be helpful um, to making sure that we're able to grow the community and, and have a healthy, diverse community. I have a comment. Um, I saw this interesting um, article by uh, Vitalik, among others, um, uh, about radical liberalism, which has to do with uh, the free rider problem in communities. And of course, uh, they are uh, proposing a, uh, you know, a solution that is hinged on um, quadratic voting and things like that, but it doesn't have to be just that. I think it is an important uh, uh, sort of avenue of thinking about these communities. The open source community has been laboring under this problem for quite a while. The tragedy of the commons, you know, the uh, um, people contributing, but the free riders uh, taking uh, a lot of those contributions and how do you stimulate uh, participation uh, from the people who are benefiting from the uh, um, activities of others? Uh, so I would urge you to read that, uh, maybe not uh, directly uh, putting that into action in the community group, but 
definitely thought thought provoking and I've been involved in this uh, free and open source community for quite a while. And this problem is uh, quite uh, acute. As you can hear from even uh, people like uh, Ram or uh, from the cello people, uh, you know, there are, uh, there is always problems expanding the uh, number of contributors to beyond a certain number or a certain committed uh, few, uh, it, it, it is, it is, it will be interesting how we can uh, look at some of those problems through the community uh, working group. Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned last week, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. It is a challenge. Um, it's always a challenge to to really grow a community beyond. Um, uh, you know, sort of its initial core uh, team. Uh, and that applies to companies, big and small, you know, that start something. <clears throat> uh, you know, just give you uh, an example, or two examples, I should say. So take a look at Kubernetes, for instance, and TensorFlow. Both are Google projects. One, they made a conscious decision to put it out as open source and actively cultivate and grow a community around it and you know they have sarah novotny and others that are you know th their job is to basically go out and uh, you know and, and and promote the community and help new people on board and encourage individuals as well as companies to come and contribute and they've been very successful and they have like over a thousand people contributing to Kubernetes in various ways. Um, so that takes a concerted effort of somebody who's paid to do that for a living, not a volunteer. Um, and, and multiples, it's not just Sarah, there are others, I'm just highlighting her since I know her. Um, but that, that, that's what it took. TensorFlow, on the other hand, they've decided that they want to retain almost exclusive control. They have cultivated, to a certain degree, a lot of sort of academic contributions but they're they're onesie twosies right they're not there's there's no non-google maintainers or committers whatever you want to call them um, to speak of <clears throat> those are still all uh, so it's very still very tightly controlled by google um and unless they decide to put somebody like a sarah and 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 make a conscious decision that they want it to grow they won't um, and that's, that's, so, you know, the working group is fine, but in the end of the day, you really need to have the en energy around something like a working group that's coming up with different ideas, actually putting them into execution, right? That's the, the real key. The thing that I'm saying is that basically coming up with ideas, anybody can do that, but then actually going out and actively trying to cultivate people to come on board, start contributing, hand-holding them through their first commits and so forth, um, that, that takes energy and effort and you can't just sort of, here's a couple of ideas. And that, and so really what I'm saying is if we're serious about that, and I think, I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't be, then I think we need to think about how do we actually take some of those ideas that we may come up with in a working group actually make them real right. yeah i think that's an important consideration how do we marry up the duocracy with whatever observations would be generated by right. this uh, and i think this is probably a big enough discussion that we probably want to continue it again um, maybe at the forefront of the agenda next week Yeah, good. I, missed, I missed the update on the document, so I'll go back and read the document, and maybe we can continue some of this through email as well. Um, the other question I would have is, what does the Linux Foundation have for guidance in this area? Do they have anything? I don't know if you've looked. Well, so we've definitely been working uh, together with uh, the other 
uh, community architects that are out there, community managers, whatever you want to call them. Um, we also have uh, Chaos, which is a, a Linux Foundation project that is focused on specifically community health in the open source space, um, which we've um, done some looking at uh, as far as kind of what they have and what we might be able to use if this working group does uh, kick off. But, uh, you know, um, in the in the working group charter, we do specifically call out the fact that we would work want to work closely with the, the chaos uh, community um, to make sure that we're learning from them, they're learning from us. Cool, thanks. Yep. I'm really interested from the last remark how many people spend 50% of their time on Hyperledger or other open source um, standards, bodies, or other stuff that is not directly their job? I do. That sounds that like was, one that of those <laughs> data collection points that the... <laughs> that, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't a, a great modality to collect the answers. Um. <laughs> All right, well, I, I think we are at the end of the hour. Um, maybe Silas, if you can remember that point to, to sort of kick off the discussion next week, that would be good. Sure. Hey, Silas. <laughs> Bob here. I do, but I'm, I'm very exceptional. You're exceptional in many ways, Bob. Well, th thank you, but but yeah, I I, I think most people working. Uh, <laughs> I think most people, you know, work working for someone in a very traditional way are obviously, you know, constrained in what they can do. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for everybody's time, and uh, uh, I guess uh, Todd, you can take us out here. All right. Thank you, everyone. Chat next week. Ciao. 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 Ciao.